Thank you so much. Greetings, everyone. Welcome and thank you for being with us. Our two-session program tonight is called Blockchain in the Open. Blockchain technology addresses a problem no other tech has been able to, trusting the network to keep everyone honest. What are the implications for this across different industries? And how are regulators responding to the potential changes this can have on those industries? What are new legal and societal challenges that may emerge? And what are the different directions these technologies may head in? And how might the entire ecosystem collaborate best given different goals? Uh, as a public benefit, Churchill Club believes that it's very important to ask the right questions and to hold deeper conversations, conversations that transcend brands in genuine effort to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. We are very fortunate to have with us tonight an amazing, diverse set of speakers who will do just that. In session one, we present Jim Zemlin of the Linux Foundation as moderator with Blythe Masters of Digital Asset Holdings, Matt Rossack of Block and Tally Ventures, Laura Shin of Forbes, and Katie Hahn of the Department of Justice and Stanford University, who is with us in a personal and not in an official capacity tonight. And then session two will be kicked off by Arvind Krishna of IBM with Brian Bellendorf of the Linux Foundation and Joy Ito of the MIT Media Lab. So we want to certainly thank IBM for their partnership in enabling this program, particularly Holly Haswell and Vanita Durrani. Couldn't have done it without you. And we would also like to thank the Linux Foundation for their invaluable assistance with a special nod to Ray George. If you're tweeting, the hashtag is Churchill Club, and there's other, other Twitter information in your bulletins. And now, let's bring up our session one speakers. Welcome to Blythe, Matt, Laura, Katie, and Jim. Have a seat. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, we have a, a fun evening planned for all of you and uh, a fascinating topic to discuss. Uh, blockchain and its related technology has been described as the trust protocol, the future of money, uh, the uh, answer to almost anything. What is the question? The answer is blockchain. <laughs> Uh, but the, uh, the technology is certainly in, uh, impacting a wide range of different areas, from the financial services sector uh, to IoT, uh, medical information, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, tonight we have an incredible panel that uh, will discuss this. I thought I would take a quick poll of the audience before we get started to see uh, what kind of crowd we have to help folks uh, gauge uh, how they respond. How many people here are Bitcoin owners or investors? I mean, okay, so a decent amount. Uh, how many people here are working on the technology related to blockchain or Bitcoin? So quite a few. Uh, how many people here from the financial industry? A few. Uh, traditional technology firms? All right, Silicon Valley, of course. Uh, retail, medical. All right, look at that. We've got so a wide range of folks. Government, how many? There we go. All me? Right. Is it just me? Underrepresented. I, think I did, I did see a couple of hands in the back. There we go. All right. Well, so we have a really diverse uh, a range of, of folks here, and you know, one of the things for any big technology movement that is important is to be able to describe the technology itself and the movement simply. And so, as a form of self-introduction for each of our panelists, I'd like you to first introduce yourselves, and then give me the 140-character description of blockchain. Are, are you All right, I'm not going to limit you to 140 characters, perhaps, but give me your simple definition. No, that was the audience's job. To tweet it out? All right. So I challenge the audience as well uh, to go ahead and tweet out your own definition, and we'll see how that goes throughout the evening. But I'll, put, uh, I'll start with Katie and put you on the spot. I'm, I'm usually on the spot as the government person, but yeah. I'll, I'll say uh, I'm not going to do 140 characters. I'm just going to do 10 words or less. The way I think of blockchain is a secure system that allows peer-to-peer -peer transfer of assets. 
So that's at its simplest, that's how I think of it. Obviously, from a government perspective, and I'm not here in my government official capacity, I'm here in my personal capacity, but, I'll, but I'm also here as I teach this topic at Stanford University. So I'll also go ahead and say that I think of it also as a really robust, um, potentially robust system for things like chain of custody, um, but also it's obviously influenced by traits like immutability, encryption, and um, it could possibly really alter how we think about trust on the internet. Very good. Blythe, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, so to uh, introduce myself, um, I run a company called Digital Asset, which is a New York-based uh, fintech uh, that provides blockchain-related software solutions to uh, large wholesale financial services providers around the world. Um, usually, when talking to that kind of audience, uh, I find it easiest to describe blockchain as uh, something very unsexy, uh, which is akin to a form of uh, distributed uh, database, uh, which is an append-only concept. Uh, it has a hardened security uh, regime, which is tamper-resistant, let's call it. Uh, it is accompanied by uh, an identity management uh, and encrypted validation framework that allows independent entities to share it to mutualize database infrastructure, which is something that just doesn't happen in traditional financial technology at all uh, and has uh, big implications for the way that people are going to manufacture uh, financial services in the future. Very good. Matthew, let's hear yours. Hi, uh, Matthew Rozak, uh, founding partner at Tally Capital. So I've uh, invested in about 20 companies in the Bitcoin blockchain ecosystem. So a lot of the bridges, roads, and tunnels uh, of the space, so think wallets, payment processors, exchanges, miners. Um, I've been in the venture business for 20 years, um, and I've never found uh, uh, an opportunity as uh, as interesting as blockchain. And and I, that to answer what is blockchain, I, I, I'm going to give a, a a little bit more of a, a obtuse uh, answer because you're going to hear lots of stories. And I think hearing Bitcoin, hearing blockchain, it's a storytelling experience. You need to hear it from 10 different people to finally get your, your, kind of your head around it. Um, I say blockchain is a journey, not a technology. It's a journey. And I think about my, my own, you know, sitting here in the Computer History Museum, my own journey with technology. And I, and I remember vividly uh, going on my BMX bike to, uh, to Kmart and buying a Commodore VIC-20, my experience with a uh, microprocessor, uh, my experience with a mobile phone, which was in a bag uh, over my shoulder. It was a heavy, uh, massive antenna experience. Uh, my first experience with the internet, which was some gopher interface uh, in college. And then now the experience with blockchain, which is still getting defined. Uh, the anatomy of a blockchain is getting figured out in front of our eyes. And if I look back at uh, computing, uh, mobile telephony, internet, and now blockchain had very similar experiences and, and very profound effects off of those technologies, uh, staircase steps. And so blockchain today is a journey. And uh, you'll hear more and more about what that journey will entail in terms of everything from encryption to the movement of money to uh, you know, changing industries. Uh, but uh, that's, that's my succinct answer. A little more than 140 characters. <laughs> I, I think you've got to do one of two, one of ten kind of uh, things. Yeah. We're going to check your ASCII art skills from that Commodore 64 experience <laughs> later. Laura, why don't you go ahead? Hi, I'm Laura Shin. I'm a Forbes contributor, and I've been covering uh, blockchain and fintech for, well, blockchain in particular for about a year, um, maybe just a few weeks longer than that. Um, but it's uh, easily the number one uh, most favorite thing I've ever covered in my entire career as a journalist. I became extremely obsessed. And um, I've you know, written extensively about the space, interviewed a number of uh, companies in it. I also co-lead um, the Forbes Fintech 50 list, which, is, uh, which was first published last year, and we're doing it again this year. Um, and then most recently, I launched a podcast called Unchained, which is about uh, blockchain and fintech. So um, please tune into the show. Um, in terms of my 140-character uh, description of blockchain, I'm going to confess that it's something that I stole from uh, some other conference I attended. Uh, somebody said that they thought a good description of it was the trust layer for the internet, which I think is a really good way to think about it. Um, you know, in terms of 
many of the interviews I've done, you know, people are talking about how you can use blockchain to securely, um, you know, ascertain somebody's identity or like or or prove your identity. Um, how you know, obviously, you securely move assets. Um, you know, uh, you know, secure or uh, be certain of the provenance of you know something like a diamond or an artwork. Um, so when it, you know you think of all the kind of scams that we see going on on the internet and uh, you know phishing attacks and stuff like that, like blockchain actually offers solution to many of those problems. And the reason is is because it's something that you can trust. Very good, Matthew. I want to put you on the spot with one other follow up question, which is sometimes. Uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technologies are conflated or people are confused. What's the difference between the two? Can you just give us a, an idea of what's, what's the difference? Like, what, how are those two distinct, complementary? Well, uh, and just as background, uh, there was a white paper issued in 2008 uh, and, and not by any happenstance um, by Satoshi Nakamoto uh, called the Bitcoin white paper. And um, that uh, blockchain, has the greatest network effect. It's, it's a $10 billion currency, which is still a baby currency, um, $10 billion market cap. And it's got a couple things associated with it. One is uh, it produced a, a digital asset that can't be replicated. That was a feat of computer science. Uh, and then two, uh, you can uh, move money uh, securely, privately, without a third party. No bank, no government, no PayPal, no Visa. Uh, that was a big deal. And so that kind of let this genie out of, out of the bottle of, of what you can do with blockchains. And, and the way I look at uh, Bitcoin and blockchain is, is almost like, I, I want to give a spaceship example, but, I wanna, but I'm going to use a railroad example. So think of blockchain as the railroads, as the rails. And think of Bitcoin as uh, the boxcars on that railroad. And there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin boxcars ever assembled um, out of this protocol. And each boxcar can be decimalized. So there's 21 million, but each one can be decimalized to 100 million, so 2.1 2 quadrillion units. And so they, they go on this uh, railroad that's underpinned uh, by these railroad ties, uh, also known as miners. And so these miners, why do they mine? Uh, it's an economic incentive for them to process transactions. And every 10 minutes, uh, they're fighting for uh, uh, 25 Bitcoin. Uh, that's the bounty that they're uh, uh, fighting for to, to process the transactions if I'm moving a Bitcoin to Blythe or Laura. Uh, and then there's this ledger, there's this train manifest that shows every transaction from the history of time. And so that's a good, at least conceptual picture of Bitcoin and blockchain. And so, you know, over the last several years, we've seen uh, this, this proliferation of Bitcoin, this flywheel of Bitcoin. Miners mine, they sell it, speculators buy, and you have this flywheel of Bitcoin um, kind of going through fits and starts, and, and now it's kind of uh, doubled, essentially, in the last few months. Uh, and then on the other side, you have the blockchain flywheel that, is, uh, that has had a billion dollars of invested capital into it that is just starting to get its applications and its transactions and its utility and its throughput uh, going. And so uh, that flywheel is just upon us in terms of the utility of the blockchain. And we're seeing other things like private blockchains, private ledgers, uh, other chains uh, proliferating. But the Bitcoin blockchain um, uh, interdependency is inextricably linked. So when someone says, well, I'm just going to use the Bitcoin blockchain to hash transactions, that's fine, but once you want to hash something in that Bitcoin blockchain, which is secure, it's a $10 billion network, uh, you have to pay a transaction fee. And what's that native transaction currency? It's derived in Bitcoin. And so you always kind of come back to the Bitcoin dynamic uh, within that blockchain. Um, and, and so we're talking about the Bitcoin blockchain, which, is, which has the most uh, network effect of, of any blockchain on the planet today. Um, the innovation that you're hearing uh, between Ripple, uh, R3, um, uh, uh, ChainOS, uh, Blythe is building a blockchain, uh, Block is building a blockchain. You're going to hear more ledgers and blockchains being built between now and then the year than, than you ever wanted. Uh, it's innovation. It's experimentation. It is a good thing for this ecosystem as we kind of get up this staircase to figure out where this uh, ultimate end state is going to be. Okay, so 
And I think, you know, tonight we want to talk about, you know, things beyond Bitcoin and the technology that's surrounding it. And I want to start with the industry that is really being impacted or uh, people are talking about uh, will be impacted, which is the financial services industry. And Blythe, I thought I would start off with you uh, by reading one of my favorite quotes as of late uh, from an article uh, published in Bloomberg. Uh, quote, with its romantic backstory, techno-libertarian Bitcoin associations, high-end marketing by the likes of Blythe Masters, and sure, why not, a technology that is superior to conventional databases for many financial users has made the back office a cool place to be. You see, it is sexy, even though you said it wasn't. So my question to you is, A, uh, is the back office now cool? Uh, B, why wasn't it cool in the first place? Uh, and how is blockchain going to really change uh, the financial services industry? Hmm. Uh, I, I will admit I've done many of these things and I've never been asked that question before. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's see where to start with that. Uh, I think that uh, let's do a bit of a, a diagnosis to start with. Hmm. Uh, the back office meaning usually uh, the processing that takes place post-trade, right. all the work that needs uh, to occur between T and whenever, however many days later, settlement occurs or, or final legal completion of a transaction. Um, in traditional financial or, or mainstream financial services uh, is an unbelievably inefficient ecosystem. And it grew up around uh, history. It, it grew out of a history uh, that, of course, reflected the fact that financial uh, instruments or assets uh, originally, uh, and actually to an extent still today, exist in physical paper form. And so uh, a very uh, manually intensive, human intensive process uh, developed around the process of transferring title and transferring the physical uh, ownership of, of those things. Um, the, the reality is, is over the last 30 years, there's been a, uh, an arms race in the development of front office technologies uh, in financial Trading markets. platforms. So, for example, nowadays you measure a competitive advantage in, uh, in a big liquid uh, stock market in fractions of nanoseconds and people are optimizing the exact angle between microwave towers in order to minimize uh, latency in uh, communications uh, and that makes a difference. And yet it still takes you know, two or three or more, depending on your asset class or your region, days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, uh, to complete that back office processing. And uh, unfortunately, um, to say that the back office has become cool uh, probably isn't the, right, isn't, the right, isn't the right interpretation here. Because if you think about what's going on generally in between that time of T, trade date, and T plus, let's call it two, nothing good happens in there. Right. Um, what goes on is uh, a process whereby all the various different parties to financial transactions who keep their own records and their own independent databases of those records. And they have to do that because it, responsibly it's the only thing they can do. Until now, there really hasn't been a mechanism to responsibly share the infrastructure from which they could draw a prime record, uh, a golden source of truth, if you will. So what they do is they keep their own independent record. And if you think about any given financial transaction, there's the, the executing broker on each side, there's the uh, clearing member on each side, the settlement participant on each side, there might be a bank involved, a liquidity provider. Uh, you've got the clearinghouse. If it's a centralized system, you've got a CSD. So a lot of entities have to sign off, each of them keeping their own separate record. And what they do is they essentially reconcile their record of the same piece of information, which, of course, if they use the same record, would become a completely redundant right. uh, piece of activity. And that is what a lot of uh, cost, time, risk, delay, and headcount is consumed with doing in post-trade processing and financial services. What blockchain technology uh, uh, enables um, uh, in, in modified form relative to the public Bitcoin blockchain, so it's some important 
uh, tweaks to the, to the technical specifications need to be made. But what it enables is sharing of a golden or prime record so that essentially reconciliation uh, becomes redundant. And what that means is that the zero value added process of comparing this piece of information with this piece of information and confirming that they're consistent or perhaps more relevantly realizing that they're not and then figuring out how to reconcile that difference when in fact both of them may be wrong um, is uh, rendered unnecessary. Uh, and that actually spells uh, the elimination of a significant amount of activity and jobs uh, in post and cost and delay and risk in post trade surfacing. Um, so if, if one is honest about this, uh, this is another uh, technology driven revolution, much like machine learning and robotics and the automobile and uh, the internet, that uh, has implications for jobs that are, isn't uh, necessarily unambiguously positive uh, in the sense that there will be a lot of low value added jobs as a, as a result of the technology developments here that are, that are lost. Right. Uh, and we could have a longer conversation about the socioeconomic, political implications of that and how do you retool workforces and make sure that the next generation is learning to code rather than to, to you know, time stamp and so on. Push paper. Maybe. Um, but that, in essence, is where the, the lion's share of the, the opportunity uh, and the efficiency reduction lies in, in financial services. It's infrastructure sharing around record keeping, which I, I'm going to stick to it. It's not sexy. <laughs> but fair, fair enough. Matt, you seem to want to jump in there. Well, I, I think um, uh, what Blythe is describing is extremely hard to do in the current environments and these uh, big financial institutions. And this is a massive stepping stone. So getting all this, this, this golden record uh, panacea is, is step one. And there's billions of cost savings in this and, and jobs. And, but th the cost savings are significant. Uh, and that's a stepping stone to what this technology can do, because there's, uh, there's encrypted workflows where you could save money by processing uh, either value or data from A to B. And that's happening right now. And that's why you're seeing a gravitational pull from every bank on the planet saying, I'm going to save billions of dollars. That's what's at stake here. Um, that's part one. Part two, where this technology gets really exciting, is now they're blockchain enabled. So they kind of like, they, they jumped in the pool, they're swimming, they're getting their, their bearings. Uh, but what, what blockchain is another, uh, the, the derivative name for that is a network enablement layer. That's not as sexy, but um, I just think the blockchain. Um, but you could build networks. That, that's where this, this technology really changes the game, is, is you, you know, the, the, the panelists here could start trading gold amongst themselves. And pretty soon we start getting liquidity, and pricing and throughput where we've cornered the gold market because we have a superior technology. And think about um, flows of value today, whether it's ACH or SWIFT or whatever. Uh, China is looking at this uh, technology very hard. And they're saying, I want to jump over these blood vessels of, of value, of global value, uh, much like um, landlines were jumped over with mobile phones. So that's where this technology really changes industries, creates new industries, uh, but we got to get there. And so, so, so kind of rewiring this plumbing, getting the psychology, getting the business process going is, is the first step. And it's a very important step. Let's come back to the plumbing in a second here. But Laura, I want to, you, you know, you've been covering this space for a while. Uh, you know, uh, Matthew men mentioned gold. What kind of assets are you seeing are some of the first uh, assets that are being tracked using blockchain? You know, I, I, aside from cryptocurrencies? Correct. Um, so the first, like, it's funny because, like, often when um, I'm at these kinds of events, I hear people saying things like, oh, you know, is there actually, like, a live blockchain that, you know, is really doing something? Um, but there is. There is a, a product that launched uh, last December. Um, it was created uh, by, uh, between, uh, with a partnership between Chain and NASDAQ. Um, and, you know, as many of you uh, may or may not know, uh, this being Silicon Valley, you probably do know, um, private companies are uh, staying private longer and um, not going public, you know, kind of like the Ubers and Airbnbs of the world. And um, managing their cap tables is uh, something that tends to, to involve a lot of paperwork. Um, traditionally, I mean, I used to work at a startup and I literally remember getting my paper certificate explaining like how so many shares I have and all this stuff. 
And um, when those get changed and, and updated, you know, it's like you, uh, depending on what system they're using, they could be using like an Excel spreadsheet or, you know, there's like multiple things that need to be done. Like you need to update the Excel document and then you need to like, you know, do, uh, um, update these papers and send them out and then the old papers, um, you know, I don't know, maybe they throw them away or whatever it is. Um, but it's just all this like paperwork. And um, what Chain and NASDAQ did was they said, hey, this is kind of like the perfect technology to use to, you know, uh, make that old paper-based system obsolete. Um, and so uh, NASDAQ has um, a unit called NASDAQ Private Market where they manage shares in private companies. And so they created this link product spelled L-I-N-Q. And um, they have begun managing shares of private companies um, on this. So that is definitely one um, use case. Uh, but, you know, the other thing that's really taking off, and, it, you know, I, I know you said you didn't want this as the answer, but the whole cryptocurrency, like, digital assets is, is, is a really hot area. Sure. Um, so. Okay. I'm going to also jump in to say that we have heard a couple of the panelists say it's not cool. I think actually some of the cool from blockchain is in some of the things the government is doing, somewhat ironically. Um, one of the ways that we're using blockchain technology is to actually, in, and I didn't actually introduce myself properly, I'm a federal prosecutor with the Justice Department, and one of the ways we're using blockchain technology is actually to help solve crimes and help catch bad guys. Um, and this is maybe somewhat counterintuitive, but we've had a number of cases now where we've actually used blockchain analytics um, in actual cases that we brought in federal court to capture some really kind of bad criminals um, from public corruption uh, to child pornographers to, of course, drug dealers uh, to arms dealers, um, people trafficking in, you know, machine guns and weapons. So. Uh, we are mining the blockchain, for, and, and I'm talking now about the Bitcoin, Bitcoin. blockchain. Um, but we are mining the blockchain. We work with blockchain analytics experts and companies all the time. So I think that's cool. Yeah. And I, actually, it sounds cool. I, it sounds that cool. is cool. But like, I to so, add but, on. Can I add so, on to my answer? Sure. Um, which is that I mentioned this briefly earlier, but identity is the big thing that everybody's also talking about in blockchain. And um, identity actually, as far as I understand from this one startup I've been talking to, is um, the second uh, biggest asset currently being tracked on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, there's a startup, Blockstack Labs. Um, they originally were one name. And what they've been doing is they've been having people claim their, what they call dot ID um, on, and they, they are, uh, you know, putting these on the Bitcoin blockchain. And they've had, I think, about, like, 50,000 people register their .id name. So, like, I'm Laura Shin .id, um, and it's on the Bitcoin blockchain. So I will forever have it, um, unless, unless somebody steals my private keys. Uh, but, but that is another big use case that, you know, I feel like every company I talk to is, like, trying to solve this because there are applications and financial services and, you know, healthcare and, I mean, there's everywhere. So that's, I think, the second big thing. That's right. Along the same vein, there's a uh, somewhat larger project that has been adopted uh, by the United Nations um, called ID2020, uh, which was founded by an uh, English entrepreneur named John Edge uh, with some partners. Uh, and his vision uh, is, you know, one of the major problems faced by um, uh, victims of human trafficking and refugees is the loss of their identity uh, and their ability to reestablish their, their rights in a, in a post-traumatic uh, world. Uh, and the idea uh, is to use blockchain technology uh, to essentially establish sovereign self-identity for vulnerable populations in advance. Uh, so working through uh, the likes of uh, UN Women, UNICEF, uh, uh, the major global NGOs, and so on, uh, to take advantage of the ability of blockchain uh, type technology to maintain and manage identities for vulnerable populations who, whether as a result of migration, uh, refugee status, human trafficking, ultimately need to be able to reestablish who they are uh, and what they're entitled to after the fact. Obviously, the, the, the bulk of the work here is not so much in the technology itself, it's in getting populations uh, engaged, but the fact that this has captured the attention of institutions like the United Nations uh, is a tremendous achievement, uh, and the fact that the technology is relatively low cost uh, and uh, scalable and accessible anywhere that you can access the internet is what has 
uh, captured their, uh, their, inf their imagination. So I, I think that one falls into the category of not sexy, but, but cool. <laughs> well, so let, 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 since you all brought it up, let's talk about the intersection, and I'll go to you, Katie, of uh, this technology and the law. Because it, it is really interesting. And, you know, in law enforcement, you're using it to, uh, you know, Catch go after the guys. bad guys. Uh, but, um, you know, in your work at Stanford, what, what, what do you, how would you characterize the most pressing legal issues as it relates to, you know, things like identity, things like what Blythe described and what you're doing? Well, I think some of the biggest legal issues are obviously right now what we see in the news relates to hacking and cybercrime. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of intersection between uh, that and the blockchain. Certainly we see, um, I mean, the fact is, obviously Bitcoin has a lot of great uses, a lot of purely legitimate uses, just like cash, right? It also has criminal uses. Uh, I mean, and I, I, I speak to a lot of Bitcoin audiences, um, but the fact of the matter is Bitcoin is being used by criminals because, of course, criminals are often early adopters of new technologies. Same way email or the Internet are used by uh, good, legitimate people and also used by criminals. So I think we, we're seeing a lot of that around hacking. Um, in terms of getting away from, for, for also on a legal side, not on a criminal side, but on a legal side, um, and Blythe already referenced this a little bit in terms of identity, but I think there's a lot being done about, about uh, certain kinds of uh, what, what I'd call traditional government functions of things like land, title registries. Um, you see pro, uh, products and um, projects in countries like Honduras, uh, Estonia, uh, the Republic of Georgia now experimenting with putting, uh, as part of their pilot program, land registry right. records on a, on a blockchain. Right. Um, I think so that there's an obvious intersection of a, government, a traditional kind of government function um, in the identity projects we've also just been hearing about. Yeah, I mean, there's the Everledger project, which is uh, a diamond tracking system using blockchain technology to, you know, sort of implement a Kimberly process to right. prevent blood diamonds from getting into the mm -hmm. system. So, you know, these are just interesting intersections of policy and human behavior and anti-corruption. Um, and I want to I want to come back to how some of the legal decisions that and, and, and adjudication that comes out of this will. Uh, by talking about something that we've seen in the headlines uh, recently, uh, which is the DAO, the DAO. Uh, so this is the concept of smart contracts uh, and the fact that there was a recent, a recent high profile hack uh, of the uh, Ethereum blockchain. Uh, so Katie, I, I wanna start with you to get your thoughts on this and then I'd like to hear from some of the other panelists. Uh, were these co smart contracts uh, all that smart? Well, I think now is a good time to remind you I'm speaking here in my personal capacity. Uh, there you go. You used the word hack, Jim, and I think that's really interesting. I think, first of all, can we just see a show of hands in the room? Who, who knows what this DAO, to use your word, hack, uh, is? So about half of the room. Okay. I think what might be useful so that everyone can benefit from this is let's actually, it's been in the news, but it's been in the news, so a lot of things have been in the news. Let's, let's break this down. What sure. is this? And I think we should start out by talking about what is the DAO itself. Jim. The Decentralized <laughs> Autonomous Organization. That you're going to have to, okay. you can't okay. push this back on me. <laughs> Basically, the concept of the DAO, as I understand it, you know, and I'm just coming to this like everyone else is, but the concept of the DAO, the history is it was one of the lar it was the largest, not one of, it was the largest crowd-funded, I've seen it referred to as a venture capital fund, but it was a crowd-sourced, crowd-funded project. And it was the largest one in history by far. By far, 100. And part of that was the value of Ether. So this is just to also kind of reset here. We're now talking about the Ethereum blockchain, not the Bitcoin blockchain. So we're switching systems. Um, but the value of Ether was very much on the rise during this time. So I believe it... Uh, it was up to 162 million. Is I think that right? Oh so, yeah. 162 million dollars worth of the Ethereum currency, Ether, was raised, crowd by a crowd uh, that's not controlled by any one person. And this crowd, this group of people who put their money in, consumers, um, were going to crowdfund projects, whatever the crowd voted on. Am I getting this right so far? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Whatever the crowd voted on, those were going to be the projects. Uh, and so they have amassed $162 million, and lo and behold, about two weeks ago, I guess it was now, right, uh, 
uh, a person, persons, he, she, I'm going to be speaking very, not, very generically here, uh, there is what Jim called a hack. I think it's a really interesting question about whether it is a hack or not, because to me, who prosecutes cybercrime and who teaches cybercrime, I think of a hack as a very specific thing. You've met the elements of a crime. So uh, whether it's a crime is, is, is still remains to be seen. But let's just, for, for everyone else, for like people just speaking in ordinarily parlance, it's, it's, a, it's hacked. This DAO, with all of this people's $162 million, is hacked to the tune of about $50 million? Mm -hmm. That's right. 60, 50, okay, lots, lots of money. Tens of millions of dollars are literally, to, to use Jim's term, hacked out of this and taken. And, the fee, and, and again, I'm going to use the word here in air quotes, thief. The thief, thieves, the group who is responsible, the individual or individuals who are responsible, have actually not come out yet uh, and identified themselves or themselves. Rather, uh, they've posted some anonymous messages basically saying, hey, this is exactly how your smart contracts are supposed to work. I didn't hack this. I merely uh, did exactly how these things are supposed to work. I exploited a vulnerability that was in your contract. So this is not a hack. And by the way, if you try to take this money back from me, I'm going to come after you. Now, interestingly, the Ethereum Foundation, and, and I want anyone to kind of stop and interrupt me if I've got any of this wrong, because I'm giving my 30,000 view. You're on a roll, Katie. Keep going. Okay, so basically, Ethereum Foundation comes in and says, oh, no. The DAO has been hacked. We must do something about this. And it's kind of tried to put the brakes on that. Um, and so then there's some real questions about, well, is that a proper course of action? Should they be good stewards of customer funds and intervene? Because it doesn't feel right that all these people's money has been taken. But then there are a lot of also questions about, well, can they just go do that? Um, so obviously, as you see, I'm just. I'm, 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 I'm sorry it happened. On the other hand, it raises a whole lot of great hypothetical legal questions for a potential law school exam um, because it, you, you have questions concerning civil liability, concerning criminal liability, I mean, uh, concerning code is law. Well, do we act, does this actually prove that this code is not law. In fact, this is not how the smart contract and this whole DAO system was meant to work. Yeah. So I think it, it raises a lot of really interesting questions. I, I want to add just one thing, not because I disagree with anything you've said, but I think that since half the audience may not be familiar with this, maybe an added nuance should be, should be clarified here. The, uh, the, the fundamental feature of uh, the Ethereum version of a blockchain is its capacity to accommodate things called smart contracts. And smart contracts are essentially code uh, so that is self-executing uh, on, a, on a blockchain in this case, on the Ethereum blockchain. And the, the contract in question that was written here was the contract that governs the operation of the DAO fund. Correct. And the essence or the rationale for the creation of smart contracts was that uh, wouldn't it be better, this is the principle of the thing, if uh, we did not have to rely upon institutions, entities, or individuals and trust them to abide by the terms of a contract? It, wouldn't it be better if rather we could rely on dependable computers because computers aren't bad actors, or at least they don't intend to be, right. um, to execute uh, these contracts for us? And it was a philosophical positioning. It wasn't it, it, it more than uh, just a technical development. The philosophical position is we don't want to have trust as a, as a necessary feature of contractual enforcement. So the irony that I think you picked up on that maybe needs to be picked out here uh, is that the feature that was hacked was a vulnerability in the computer code itself uh, that was self-executing uh, that was, uh, with hindsight, very transparent. Um, and the question is, given the scale of the investments that were made on the back of this, it's not the Ethereum blockchain itself that's been compromised, but it's a fund using a contract written thereon uh, that had a bug. Um, given that scale, which roughly represents 10% of the total cryptocurrency traded on that blockchain, is that too big to fail, to be allowed to fail? 
right. to prove yeah, the point. And the, ir the right. irony is that the genesis of this technology arose in the aftermath of uh, the global financial crisis and the understandable uh, uh, high emotions and debate around the topic of uh, what happened, uh, the loss of trust, and the subsequent bailouts uh, that occurred. And yet here we find in a piece of technology that was advertised as essentially addressing the weaknesses of that whole framework, essentially a second too big to fail moment where a decision has to be made whether to change the rules of the contractual game after the fact, even right. though it was advertised as something that would never be messed with by a human being because it was to be executed by code. So yeah. It's actually philosophically, legally, so what, a very, very interesting, uh, very interesting well, topic. It's quite From, from it's your quite perspective complex. in the financial sector, what lesson can we learn from that? Should we build financial systems that have no recourse or bailout? Like, what, what, what's your perspective on that? Well, I, you know, maybe, maybe I can somewhat dodge the question by answering, <laughs> <coughs> by answering uh, th with the following uh, observation, which is that, as I mentioned earlier, I run a company that builds uh, software, blockchain-enabled software, straight through processing systems, es essentially, for wholesale financial services, who are uniformly extremely highly regulated entities. Right. For example, the notion of uh, them facilitating or engaging in anything touching upon anonymous transfers of value over the internet between unknown entities uh, with unknown transaction processing dependencies on miners that can't be contracted with in advance, uh, depending on the jurisdiction you're operating in, uh, varies from unwise to illegal. Right. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we, have, we make tweaks to the, the tech specifications of the traditional or the original Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain to, to address those uh, those issues. So hence the introduction of things called uh, private uh, networks or private blockchains um, or private distributed ledgers where uh, not anyone can play but only a pre-credentialized uh, uh, and known universe uh, can participate. So there's no anonymous activity by definition. Uh, another, another feature when you have no anonymous activity by definition is you can set up some rules of the road in advance uh, that will comply with an existing rule book right. governing a financial market that say, for example, when something goes wrong, how do you handle reversibility, accountability, liability, um, so that there is actually a mechanism for, for intervening, assuming that you have a rule of law uh, upon which to allow, uh, rely in the, in the context uh, of that relevant market, which by and large, in large wholesale regulated financial markets, you do have. Right. Uh, and so, uh, put another way, in none of the solutions that we're building for deployment in large scale commercial settings, are we relying on fully public networks or on uh, situations where smart contracts are able to be uh, uh, essentially relied upon without uh, a mechanism for uh, intervening, call it a kill switch, call it an override, call it a regulatory uh, supervision role, um, one yep. of the above. We, we, have, we have no implementations that don't uh, have those, uh, those speed bumps. Yeah, I mean, let's, I be, get let's be clear here. We're, we're, yeah. we're playing in one of the most uh, regulated industries in the world. It's called money. And so uh, uh, blockchains and, and digital currencies uh, are, are going to cross lots of lines in, in D.C. and beyond. Um, and so th th there's this philosophy early in the days of, of Bitcoin, like, oh, you don't need uh, government regulation. You can move money around. And that's that's great uh, ethos. There's a great uh, uh, dynamic there. But I, I think to get mass adoption for, for businesses, for banks, um, for governments, uh, there are going to need to be guardrails. There, there is going to need to be some semblance of, of identity and uh, having uh, common denominators that, that uh, address those issues. Um, and then uh, you look at other use cases. We talked about uh, identity, um, which is a huge use case for blockchain. Um, look at consumers in uh, developing nations. So if you're a, a goat herder in Ghana, a, uh, a taxi driver in Indonesia, or a soccer mom in Brazil, you, you, there's, a, there's a section of this planet that will never get a credit card or a bank account ever in their lives. So to talk about Bitcoin and, and uh, buying a pair of jeans or, or uh, a cup of coffee with Bitcoin in this room, we've got plenty of, of fantastic payment rails with you know, credit cards and PayPal and whatever. 
But in that uh, part of the world, they all have you know, one of these in their pocket. They have a supercomputer in their pocket. And if they could buy some Bitcoin, uh, it could change their life. Because that soccer mom could buy you know, Air Jordans for their kid. The goat herder could buy feed for the goats. Uh, and get into the global economic uh, uh, system. And, and that's a big game changer. And so uh, those guardrails, those dynamics are going to evolve over time. So you have a consumer piece, you have an enterprise piece, and then you have a government piece. And the, all the adoption curves, all the different uh, regulatory regimes are going to uh, be disjointed uh, and, and take on different lives uh, of their own. Um, can I add something to this discussion about the DAO? Um, so one thing that has really struck me as a reporter in this space is that there's kind of this conception that, like, oh, the technology is doing this. Like, the technology, you know, wipes out all these intermediaries, and we can just rely on, on this, like, machine to do all this stuff. Um, but what is so fascinating to me is that actually, um, particularly as I've discovered with the public blockchains, although this I'm sure will also be the case with the private ones, um, is that there really is a massive human element. Um, I don't know if some of you saw the New York Times article that came out in the last couple of days about um, the role of China in Bitcoin. This is something I also covered in a very long article that I wrote in like February. Um, but essentially, um, in order to process Bitcoin transactions, you need the miners to process them. And the vast majority of the miners are in China. And, um, you know, there, I mean, this is like going to go too much into the weeds, but just generally, um, there was a debate in Bitcoin over how exactly to, um, to develop the, advance the protocol so that it could process more transactions. And um, because the miners are the ones who are actually processing the transactions, um, a lot of people that were, you know, on one side or the other here in the U.S. or, or generally in the West felt like they needed to get the miners on board to, like, either switch or not switch. Um, and ultimately, the miners, they really didn't want to make a switch. Um, but the point is that, you know, we have this idea like, oh, blockchain, blockchain is going to do it. The technology is going to do it. No, but in reality, you need to get people involved. And that, you know, goes back to the DAO thing, which is, I hear people thought, oh, we can create this smart contract and it's going to create this organization that's, you know, autonomous. It just runs by code. And, like, we just press a button and da 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 We'll do it all for us. And, no, it, like, as you can see, there have been mistakes. And now people are either potentially going to get involved or not because there's another complication. There were these, like, people that were selected to be curators of this DAO. And it wasn't entirely sure what their function sure. was. And so, anyway, the point is that... When I, you know, am looking kind of like there, there has been this big question of, you know, are the public blockchains going to win out or are the private ones going to win out? And um, uh, politically, I feel like a lot of people um, have a stance one way or the other because they're like, oh, public blockchains are the way to go. This is generally kind of the libertarian crowd. Um, you know, they are, uh, they shun authority and they, you know, want everybody to just do it on their own, like open source all the way. Um, you know, but when it comes to something like financial services, trust is a major issue. And so this is something I have covered in a few articles, but um, that's why when I kind of like grapple with this question of, oh, you know, are the financial institutions, the incumbents, are they going to win out or will the startups taking them on? Will the fintechs, will these new blockchain startups, will they win out? And, it, you know, I don't want to offend any of the blockchain startups on this panel. Um, but the truth is, when I look at this question, because of this element of trust and consumers needing to trust where they're putting their money and what's going on with their money, it's probably a bit more of an open question than you might think, um, you know, because I think the conventional wisdom or what a lot of people tend to say is like, oh, open always beats closed. And they're like, look at the internet, you know, it's like the internet went out, the web went out over like AOL and CompuServe and blah, blah, blah. So sure. they, they think the same thing's going to happen with Bitcoin. And I, I personally probably think like eventually down the road that that may be what we see, but in the beginning, it may not because of, like I said, Sure. You know, what, what we do with our money, we're, we're going to have to be able to trust. And, you know, as Blake was saying, like, if you have a company that you trust to reverse, like, a mistake transaction, like, things like that, then you would probably prefer to put your money there. So Sure. And now we're going to get to our, and audience questions in a minute. Uh, Blythe, I want to quick go to you. And then uh, I have one last question for the panel before we get into the uh, audience questions. So, Blythe. So, so just, just uh, I think... The initial debate uh, that, that grew up around uh, the surge of enthusiasm uh, for Bitcoin as a potential for disintermediating existing financial intermediaries, I think that 
that, that positioning has uh, become much more nuanced and it's moved on. It's very clear that this uh, technology, just like almost every technology, uh, can be uh, adapted and evolved and specified in different ways to meet different use cases and, and different needs. And in my, in my view, there, there is unlikely uh, to end up being one blockchain to rule them all. Uh, uh, public, the public Bitcoin blockchain, uh, which is uh, indubitably the, uh, the most successful so far, serves a purpose which cannot uh, be uh, adapted to uh, wholesale regulated financial services activities, but it serves a purpose, and that's the reason why it's been successful. Right. Um, there is a lot of work going on now in the open source domain under the auspices of the Linux Foundation, within which something called the Hyperledger Foundation has been set up to bring together a very diverse group of uh, uh, participants that range from the world's biggest financial firms, banks, exchanges, and otherwise, uh, it, through and including the world's biggest uh, technology companies, the likes of IBM, thank you IBM for sponsorship today, <laughs> and uh, uh, Intel and, and many others, uh, and of course uh, the startups, and there are those startups that really exist to disintermediate existing financial services businesses and those like us that exist to help them out. Right. Um, and uh, a tremendous amount of, of work is going on now to introduce standards, commonality of, of framework, uh, to take uh, the best uh, thinking tested in the uh, community, uh, evolve code bases so that they can actually be ready to support business. Right. Um, and, and big business, not just, not just micro business. Right. Uh, and that, I think, uh, if, if you were asking a question, you know, how long is this all going to take? Is it really happening? Is it going to be mainstream? You get these questions all the time. If the answer to it will be mainstream uh, in 10-ish years' time is yes, then you would have to reverse into the kind of activity that you're seeing happening today. Exactly. And it's happening. Um, not only are we seeing uh, uh, firms building proprietary solutions, but you're also seeing firms open source that technology, share it with a view uh, to essentially making early adoption easier uh, and growing the pie rather than keeping things proprietary. So, uh, you know, my, my view is that uh, some of the initial, you know, us versus them positioning of all of this is, is you know, we're way beyond that point at this stage. Right. This is a technology that is extremely powerful definitely changes the way uh, uh, that people think about uh, security, information processing, uh, mutualizing uh, in order to share costs and reduce uh, risk. We haven't talked much about transparency, uh, but the irony is that what was initially invented as a quasi-anonymous uh, or fully anonymous uh, facilitator actually produces the ability for regulators and others to watch with a bird's eye or a god's eye view uh, activity that has been obscure to them uh, and fragmented across uh, silos right. for decades. Uh, so there's, there's huge upside here, and I think, uh, I think uh, boiling it down to who's going to win and who's going to lose is, 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 is uh, too simplistic of an analysis. Bottom line is, if you think about what happened to the internet, or the companies confronted by the internet, there were some that grew out of it, and it brought us Facebook and Google and the giants that you know, some that got wiped off the face of the planet, the, the, the blockbusters, the vast majority of everybody else adopted and adapted. Right, right. And that, and that leads me to the, the question I want to ask each of you to briefly answer, and then we're going to go to audience Q&A, which is, I think you're right, and now it's time to roll up our sleeves, right? To, you know, some, there is so much code to be written here. No one's going to write it by themselves. This is something that we all have to collectively do. There's regulatory, law enforcement implications. There's uh, just getting the critical mass of, uh, you know, different financial institutions to convene on the same ledger is an arduous task. In that context, just a brief answer of what in your mind are the big challenges and, and one thing we can do to move that challenge forward? The thing that comes to my mind is just communications um, because I do think that it's so important to have a communication strategy um, to, and, and, and there are some entities that exist that are facilitating that. There's the Blockchain Alliance. Uh, which uh, can, counts amongst its members a number of financial institutions, startups, tech companies, as well as, I think, at this point, 40 federal government agencies and international government agencies, state and locals are joining kind of by the week 
um, and, and the Blockchain Alliance is really uh, kind of a private-public partnership um, of sorts. But I think communications is important because you still, even now we're talking about this, I still hear people who know about the DAO and the child DAO and Ethereum and they say, oh, Ethereum was hacked. Well, of course, it wasn't Ethereum that was hacked. It's far more nuanced than that. Right. Or you hear, oh, Bitcoin. Was Bitcoin hacked, someone asked me? Um, so I think just getting out there and, and getting a cohesive communication strategy is really important because I do think there are a lot of myths and then there are also a lot of truths. I think there is some reluctance to, like I said, embrace the fact that you know um, bad elements of society can use good technologies just like good elements of society use those. So I think yeah. recognizing that truth, adopting it as part of the communication strategy is pretty critical to moving forward. Uh, the, the, the three biggest issues that, that typically get cited here uh, relate to uncertainty around regulation and, and changes for, uh, need for changes thereof. Um, the so-called network effect, which is how do you get multiple independent entities to We'll get religious, religion at the same time and show up at the same church and, and jump on board with the same technology. Right. And, and, and corresponding, it's a related issue, is, you know, standard, standards, because there's a huge um, first mover disadvantage. If you, if you run fast, uh, get yourself out ahead of the pack, and you end up choosing the wrong technology choice, and, and the world, you know, that goes out of fashion, and the world goes in a different direction. So what you, what you need is to have mechanisms for uh, addressing those three things. On the regulatory front, um, it, it, it's a, that's a big, complex, sprawling set of issues that ranges from consumer protection, uh, uh, criminal uh, prevention, uh, systemic market infrastructure regulation, prudential supervision, you name it. There are many different regulators and different regulatory issues. The bottom line, though, is that regulators have evolved materially in the last year from a position where they were uniformly skeptical, worried, and basically, you know, what part of anonymous uh, exchanges of value over the internet did anyone think was a good idea was kind of the starting point. Um, that's evolved now to a good appreciation, it's an education process, of the uh, enhancements to transparency, the reductions to risk, the reductions to cost that the technology can deliver. So that is an education process, but the regulators actually, by and large, have all the power they need to control what happens to systemic market infrastructures. You want to run a stock market that's meaningful to the United States, Go meet your regulators. Right. You, you, can't, you can't just make one of those up and you know, start from scratch. And you have to demonstrate resiliency and recovery and uh, redundancy and uh, privacy and um, all of that good stuff. But if well, you can do that... Will that get us the religion and standards yeah, at the same time? That's getting us there. It's yeah. getting us there. So you don't, you, don't go, you don't go and have a conversation with the regulator that says, you don't mind if I run the US stock markets on a blockchain, do you? <laughs> you know, that's a short conversation. And, you know, you go... You go, you go <laughs> You go and you say, I understand the regulatory framework and, and the compliance requirements are the following 92 things, and these are the 92 ways that I'm going to comply with the following, you know, with right. your framework. What else are you worried about? And, and that's a much, uh, and by the way, just before we, you know, get too much into this, this is a new form of database technology. This is not, you know, this is not uh, cryptocurrencies uh, for the masses or distributing, um, uh, you know, stock uh, in violation of securities laws without, you know, constraints on marketing. Once you get those messages across, that has become a much easier dialogue. Right. And the fact that there are people like myself who spent 30 years in the financial services sector before moving into the technology sector who can actually speak that language has begun to really help. And, and I'm by no means alone in that regard. Right. Um, so that, I think the standards is, you know, things like Hyperledger Foundation, and you mentioned others. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a whole slew of these. They're, 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 being, they're being very helpful in that regard. Uh, and then finally, this network effect, um, what you're seeing is, is market infrastructure providers. So think major centralized stock markets with uh, attached uh, settlement clearing, CSDs, the DTCCs, et cetera, of this world. What are they? They're utility-esque, sometimes explicitly, sometimes owned by the street, sometimes not. They're centralized. They are plumbed to the street. They already provide technology for a living. They're already used by everybody. They essentially propagate standards themselves. They have an incentive to adopt this technology, and if you're uh, uh, working to introduce this technology there, 
That's a single point of sale, a single point of decision making. And as long as they can demonstrate cost savings and benefits to their customers, you don't have to persuade every one of their customers separately to get religion. Because yeah. they roll that out. You want, to, you want to trade the Australian stock market. There's one post-trade infrastructure. That's it. There is no choice. And if they choose to replace their infrastructure, existing 30-year-old COBOL programmed infrastructure with distributed ledger tools, which they're in the process of evaluating as we speak, they can do that. They, they can't annoy their customers. They can't let them down. They can't let it break. They've got to keep their regulators happy. But they can do that. And that is what is actually happening. Right. So the network effect is being tackled by finding central points that are natural places through which to sell uh, this technology. And, and you know, relative to a year ago, that has changed uh, completely again. So I think those three uh, barriers uh, or obstacles are, are being chipped away at uh, with, a, with a high degree of efficacy. And, and to that point, but you're also seeing um, you're also seeing regulators come out and say, "Hey, here is the regulation." Now, some people don't like that, um, but on the other hand, a lot of entities and people say, "Well, at least we now know what it is." Uh, you know, we have to comply with this license, or you know, FinCEN, the Treasury Department, has come out with guidance saying, "Yes, you are subject to this." and here's what you have to do. So at least we are also seeing regulators come out and provide a roadmap of sorts for certain elements of play, exactly. certain of the elements in this space. Yeah. So I want, to get to, I want you to go, Matt, and then uh, I want to get to audience Q&A here because I know that's an important part of the evening. So Laura, if you'll forgive me, I want to go quick to Matt and have him answer, and then maybe someone from the audience will pose okay. a question to you as well. So I would echo everything uh, Blythe is saying. So standards, network effects, regulation uh, makes all the sense uh, in the world to articulate those three. But if I think back uh, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, what were the challenges? And I see what's transpired in this space. Uh, again, a billion dollars of venture capital coming in. Uh, Bitcoin at a $10 billion market cap. Uh, Ethereum going from a $16 billion, $16 million crowd sale to a billion dollar market cap. Um, Every uh, 18 months ago, top 100 banks on the planet articulated a blockchain strategy. Every Fortune 1000 CTO has what is my blockchain strategy on their whiteboard, much like what was my internet strategy 20 years ago. Uh, so I, I, I view this less as challenges because I, I see so much innovation, so much uh, experimentation, uh, capital being poured into the space, people uh, jumping into the ecosystem, that it's... Uh, I view this as a generational opportunity for entrepreneurs and investors. I, I've never seen something uh, this profound in my career. And so, and, and so seeing all these swaths of people and capital and energy, uh, I, I see uh, you know, uh, great things on the horizon. And, and you, if you look at the Dow attack or the Mt. Gox uh, debacle, these are all lessons learned. These are all you know, uh, early ecosystem dynamics. Um, you know, uh, put your seatbelt on, put the helmet on. It's, it's, we're still in early days of, of these public blockchains. Uh, on, on the private blockchain side, uh, everybody, again, is still trying to figure out what the anatomy of a blockchain is, identity models. That's happening in real time right in front of our eyes. And it's, it, this is like an amazing ecosystem to be a part of. All right, let's go to a couple of audience questions here. I want to give opportunities. So how do we, do we have a mic? There we go. Hi, this is Ray Wan with Constellation Research. Uh, one, someone pointed out the fact that you know a blockchain is almost as good as the humans behind it. Let me ask the question in a different way. What are the digital ethics uh, behind blockchain that people should aspire to build in, uh, building towards as they're designing their blockchain and their blockchain models? Question. What are the digital ethics that people should consider? Kate, I, I got to throw that one to you. Me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Being in uh, law enforcement, but not in official capacity today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, great question. Um, one of the things I think is important is as people rush to kind of put, oh, we can put this on the blockchain. We can put this. We can automate this. Um, I heard someone say, garbage in, garbage out. I think the kind of thing that stands out to me the most is if you're putting stuff on the blockchain, let's make sure that stuff you're putting on is itself accurate in the first place. Because the blockchain is so, we always hear it's so reliable, you know, it's inherently trustworthy. But take, for example, the, uh, the example that we've talked about tonight of um, land registration records. You need to have, you, you can't go to a country or a county that has completely messed up land registration and title records now and put those on the blockchain. I think you need to have uh, a 
go to a system that's already working well on the paper system and put those on the blockchain and use that as an experiment first. So from a kind of ethical perspective, I think you want to make sure what you're putting on the blockchain is itself accurate. I, I mean, uh, the finan this is an invention which is focused on money, as you've heard. Uh, it, it turns out that the, the world actually uh, has spent a lot of time thinking about the ethics that surround the treatment of other people's money. Uh, there's, there's, a whole rate, there's a whole industry globally that does you know, a variously good job and is regulated to variously high standards around that. The, the bottom line is, is that if uh, this technological revolution evolves as a form of regulatory arbitrage that seeks to avoid the body of law, ethics, etc., that exists for good reason around money, that will be a disaster. And there are some examples of that, and I'm not going to go into them here and now, but there are some examples of that. If you think about what, what those ethics are, it's around treating our customers fairly, honesty, transparency, accountability, data integrity, privacy, oversight, reversibility. These are all principles that exist in financial regulation today. They're not necessarily always abided by, that not every, for, every regulatory regime is the same. But, but if you use this technology to navigate around those, it will be a disaster. Let's go to another question. Next um, question. Over yeah, here. Yeah. I have a question. Um, as we move the blockchain away from cryptocurrencies to more general things like um, land registry, how will the miners be paid? <laughs> so, Laura, Matt, I want to uh, Through a transaction fee. So in that instance, if they uh, hash it into a public blockchain, they would pay a transaction fee, and that's how they would get paid. So there's this dynamic now that, uh, you know, again, there's only going to be 21 million uh, Bitcoins issued out of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, about 14 million have been issued to date, plus or minus. And so we're two thirds through the, 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 you know, the issuance of, of Bitcoin. Uh, once all the Bitcoins get issued, so what's, what's left in the economic incentive? And it's going to be these transaction fees because that network effect will start to, to kick in and uh, that security uh, blockchain will, will uh, be paid in uh, uh, transaction fees. Um, I uh, will give a, 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 that would be true if you were using the public Bitcoin blockchain uh, for, for, such, for such things. I think um, that raises a whole series of questions uh, when you're talking about very large scale activities and a finite uh, amount of resources uh, and a native currency unit uh, on the uh, blockchain in question. Uh, almost all of the private chains that are uh, being contemplated for use for regulated financial services and as an alternative don't have a native currency unit analogous to a Bitcoin uh, contemplated as part of their design. And those that participate in the use of those networks essentially have an incentive to process transactions, if that's what you want to call it. That's probably the, the equivalent of mining. Um, by virtue of the utility that they derive from being able to use a stable network. Uh, if you think about the major financial infrastructure providers and, and financial institutions of the world, they're all, they're all technology companies themselves. They all operate server farms. They all have uh, significant computing resources. And they outsource a lot of that to major technology companies, that, you know, the likes of IBM, Amazon, so on and so forth. Um, those same providers will be doing the same thing in this context. The incentive uh, to keep this network stable is that you get to run your business on it. Uh, so there is no need for... The, uh, uh, the, the profit interest of mining in the same or conventional way that there was in the context of a purely public network where, by definition, anyone or everyone can play and no one can be censored or prevented from playing. You have to create a financial incentive because no one uh, knows each other. Uh, if, you, if you have a private network uh, with a finite number of users, there's an incentive to keep that thing uh, resilient and stable. Uh, and essentially, that's that's how private uh, private blockchains work. Well, but to your, and I'll, but I have a follow up on that, which mm -hmm. is to your previous point. If more efficiency can be put into that system, and I'll put it in the consumer context for this crowd, uh, are my uh, credit card processing fee is going to go down? No, so that the credit card processing is one of the lowest cost uh, f uh, forms of financial services known to mankind. 
Uh, just, just, for, just for the record. I mean... And, uh, Maybe some people out here might sorry, disagree with but, that. But. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to distinguish between which... Bar, which uh, the credit card networks, as in Visa, MasterCard, etc., which is what is the processing of the payments as opposed to the provision of credit and the risk-taking of the system, right. which is not done by Visa or MasterCard, for, for the record, is one of the most efficient processing uh, processes. If you were building it from scratch today, you may very well choose uh, to use a, a blockchain uh, technology to replace it. And maybe one day when they get around to doing that, they will, but they've no incentive to do it. The marginal cost of processing a credit card transaction uh, on the Visa network is, is a very, very small number. Is a very small number. Okay. That doesn't mean that ultimately the cost of using your credit card is a small number, but you've got to, you've got to know where the money, uh, the money gets charged, and it's not in that. Understood. For the record. Let's go to the next question. I don't know where the mic is here. I can't see very well into the audience. Hi. There we I'm go. Thomas. I'm with Rensselaer Polytechnic, and I had a question about the nature of Bitcoin technology, and that relates to this. Is um because early on in the presentation or in the uh, discussion, I heard terms like trust layer and security mentioned with regards to block blockchain and distribu distributed ledger technology. However, as both demonstrated both theoretically and practically, blockchain technology as it stands isn't perfectly secure um, and actually introduces a whole new class of network attacks, which are especially prevalent in smaller emerging blockchains. Think the uh, ledgers of a company rather than the um, entire block the entire Bitcoin blockchain to date, and as well as the uh, noted insecurity of the informational infrastructure of a blockchain, like exchanges and, and so forth, the railroad ties mentioned earlier. And my question was, how you planned on reconciling this with um, b the blockchain's huge potential in areas where security is of value, like enterprise applications? So I'm going to give that to both Laura and Matt. How are we going to, uh, although one could argue where are we today versus uh, what bit, uh, blockchain technology could offer from a security perspective, but the question I believe is how will we solve security pro uh, problems as they relate to blockchain in things like enterprise applications? And you mean in private chains, not public chains? In both. If the question is, you know, are, are, how, how do you secure a, a private blockchain that has, you know, again, the, the, the folks on this panel each running a node and confirming transactions amongst ourselves, each one of us are vulnerable or, or our back office is vulnerable or our servers vulnerable to some kind of a, a internal attack versus it being distributed and decentralized. I think it depends on the use case. I think, you know, there's ways to narrow the uh, attack vectors on private uh, blockchains because use cases uh, that, that uh, private blockchains are, are addressing are, are just different. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the throughput, the volume, the um, uh, auditability, the uh, um, identity, all these dynamics that are important for highly regulated industries, whether you're in uh, a bank or an insurance company, uh, you have to kind of uh, weigh the, the, the benefits and, and the pros and the cons between uh, doing something on a public blockchain or a private blockchain. And so you're going to see this proliferation of private blockchains and uh, whether they're encrypted workflows or true networks that are being built. And then over time, you're going to see this uh, standards interoperability uh, wallets that, that are a browser to the blockchain. So you could see stuff in uh, multi-asset, multi-token, multi-chain uh, visibility of what you're doing, uh, assuming that this proliferation of chains continues for the next decade, uh, there's going to be a lot of innovation. There's going to be a lot of protocols, a lot of different uh, uh, technologies out there, and, and, and there's going to be a common denominator. It's going to, uh, you know, if, if you know, history is any lesson, it's going to form to kind of help tether all this together. Uh, and, you know, the, the private blockchains are going to have different, different use cases, different security models. Yeah. Katie, you think a lot about security. So. I think a lot about security. I mean, any system that says it's impenetrable, I just find uh, that quite a claim. But uh, when you're talking about private blockchains, I think one thing that could be done is use some of the kind of ha white hat hacking companies out there that uh, plenty of enterprise companies use to uh, go. It's kind of equivalent of bug bounty. That could certainly be done uh, with private enterprise and private blockchains. But I would also say that right now we're thinking about the security, and yes, it's, it's, it's very secure. The 
the, pub, the Bitcoin blockchain is very secure in the sense that uh, it would require you know, a takeover of this entire network of computers. However, that's what we're talking about today. I have heard people say, well, what about in five years or 10 years when we have quantum computers? Then is the Bitcoin blockchain going to be really secure at all? I think that's a really interesting question. So we, we, we focus on security right now. We also need to be thinking about how security will evolve. Uh, that, that question is one which is where a lot of the cutting-edge thinking of what's going on in uh, blockchain technology today is focused. Uh, and one of the issues is that uh, there is a concern related to um, the notion that if you put sensitive private contractual financial information onto, uh, into a distributed network and then claim that it's encrypted and therefore protected, and yet that encryption becomes vulnerable, for example, to advances in, in quantum computing, uh, then you've created a systemic risk of epic proportions. Um, so uh, where the cutting edge thinking in this area is, uh, is evolving is in ways in which to keep that, to keep that uh, bilateral or multilateral uh, contractual detailed information off chain use the chain as a mechanism for keeping track of proofs that activity that took place is actually consistent with that bilaterally preserved uh, information. Uh, and when I mentioned earlier that uh, the use of uh, what people today commonly understand as uh, smart contracts uh, uh, is something one has to be very cautious with uh, for regulated uh, markets, that actually was a subpart of what I was talking about. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of work going on right now. And I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not, but I, it, it's definitely relevant to the subject that you were asking about. Um, but keeping uh, the most sensitive information off-chain, using the chain to ensure compliance with it or uh, to permit uh, independent validation of it, verification of it, uh, is, is, where, is the direction that this space is, uh, is going in, as, at least as it relates to... Uh, wholesale financial service. And then Blythe, I have a question. Um, how is the off-chain sensitive information, how is that stored? Uh, also encrypted, but only uh, in a way where only the parties that are, have a need and right to access it or are party to the contracts are able to access it. And it's a cold so storage even if you like threw, that? Even if you threw a, a, a quantum computer at the, the public uh, chain, you couldn't, reverse, you couldn't reverse into that information. Okay. And is it like cold storage, like not connected mm -hmm. to the internet? Oh, oh okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, and, and we're going to get one last question in, but, you know, I think at every level of security, so at the Linux Foundation, the other thing we're doing here is you have to write secure code in the first place, create a culture of secure coding practices, right? Are you threat modeling? Are you, do you have full test suite coverage? Uh, are you fuzzing your code? Are you, uh, you know, having a secure, responsible disclosure policy, et cetera, et cetera. So from what Blythe is talking to all the way down into writing good code in the first place, these are things that are going on to make sure that these systems do remain secure and uh, as secure as they can be in, in a world that, as Katie put out, uh, uh, building a perfect system is a, an ever chasing your tail. I think we have time for one last question here, so I don't know who has the mic, but we'll go to you. Get one back here. Um, my name is Rick Seeger from Cisco. Um, blockchains are very inefficient uh, as compared to traditional uh, shared databases. Um, and we're willing to put up with that inefficiency because the benefit we get is uh, we can have un untrusted actors uh, transact with each other. Now, in the case of the banks where the actors are known and trusted, what is the actual benefit there um, over a traditional database? I got to give that to you because you brought Sorry. it up earlier. Yeah. It's a new form of database technology. Yeah, so, no, Why is it better right. than the he's old right. form of database? So, no, we, what, what he's referring to is the fact that the, the mechanism for arriving at um, agreement on uh, what is the, the truth, the state of truth in the, in the shared database in the public Bitcoin blockchain, which is used by anyone and everyone, and therefore we have to assume there's plenty of bad actors present, is something called proof of work, which is a, uh, essentially a, a lottery uh, that can be won by deploying computing power. So CPUs and uh, electricity get wasted, in inverted commas, in the process. Um, in, uh, uh, in an environment where you can substitute for the completely uncensored open access model of the public Bitcoin blockchain, and instead 
assume a known number of entities uh, that are subject to a common rule of law, a common law book, uh, pre-identification, etc. Uh, you can essentially use other uh, consensus methodologies than proof of work to arrive at uh, agreement on what the valid state of a database is. There are a number of those, uh, uh, one known as PBFT, uh, which is being used within uh, one of the uh, projects within the Hyperledger Foundation, for example, uh, will allow um, as many as 30% uh, of the nodes on a network to be compromised um, before the overall network itself uh, can be compromised, um, but doesn't use proof of work at all, and therefore has the added benefit of not only not being uh, debatably uh, uh, environmentally um, offensive because of wasting so much electricity. Uh, uh, it has the ability to process transactions at a rate of throughput that is in a completely different league and many orders of magnitude above that of the public Bitcoin blockchain. So again, if you want to process, you know, the public Bitcoin blockchain is capable of, of, of dealing with a couple hundred thousand transactions a day. Uh, if you want to deal with a national stock market, you need to be dealing with hundreds, if not thousands of transactions per second. So completely different uh, order of magnitude. Uh, and, and that is one of the other main reasons why uh, large-scale uh, processing activities in financial services, for example, as used by banks or market infrastructures, have moved away from the public Bitcoin blockchain. Well, we're running, we run out of time. Uh, but, you know, thank you so much to the panel. I mean, every one of you said that at, who have incredibly distinguished careers, this is the most interesting thing you're reporting on, the most exciting investment opportunity, the biggest revolution in the financial services sector. I didn't say and anything. And you didn't say one thing, but I'm speaking for you. Uh, a better way to catch bad guys? Can, yeah. we, uh, <laughs> can we go with that? Uh, but certainly, this is a journey, and uh, hopefully, all of you will continue this journey and we have a wonderful group coming up next to talk about uh, the technology and the future of this technology, of the blockchain technology itself. So thank you. Thank you. Before you get up, before you get up, and before we start our next uh, session, we have for you, as a small token of thanks, a Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. Oh. oh. Wow. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. That is all. I, uh, I need more t-shirts from uh, these kind of events, so this thank is ideal. So thank you very much. Thank and you. now we will welcome up Arvin, Brian, and Joey.